Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being in our class today. We begin a new quarter of study this morning, focusing upon the wonderful New Testament book of Ephesians. Doug has agreed to be my distribution engineer, so if there's anyone who has not yet received a study guide, if you'll just raise your hand, we'll bring one to you. Anybody right down here? Anybody else need a book this morning? If you need a book, we are more than happy to provide it for you. We want everyone to, to have that foundation's study guide. Very good. I will tell you, I feel a little bit odd this morning doing the introductory lesson to a new quarter. I feel a little bit odd because the person who designed this lesson is sitting here on the sixth row. And the person who is much more eminently qualified to do an introduction to any literary work is also the same person sitting here on this sixth row. But somehow the luck of the draw has it that I'm doing the introductory lesson this morning, so just be kind, okay? Anyone else need a book? Anyone else who does not have a book? If you need a book, we'll bring one to you. Very good. So I want to begin this morning by saying, having just completed the books of First and Second Timothy, reading and studying all of Paul's instruction in those two books to his young understudy about the work of the gospel that is to be carried out in Ephesus, I think this is certainly a logical place for us to go for a follow-up study. So if you would just go ahead and take your foundation study guide and open it to that first lesson, and you're going to immediately recognize that the lesson text suggested in that study guide for today's introduction to this book is the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. And that's a hint, by the way. You're going to need your study guide in one hand and your Bible in the other hand. I'd like to ask that you go ahead and be turning to Acts chapter 19 because that's where we're going to be parked this morning, the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. It has been said that the book of Ephesians, more than any other book that you will find in the New Testament, presents the plan of God for the church. And I think it would probably be very hard to argue against that statement. The supremacy of Jesus Christ in God's eternal plan is presented so very well in the book of Ephesians. Everything that God had planned, all of the work of God, all of the structure that had been put in place for all of the various generations, all pointed to the supremacy of Jesus in God's eternal plan. And now the message of God is not just for Jews, it is for Jews and Gentiles alike. The gospel is for everyone, it is for the whole world. And as I read that statement this week by a particular commentator, that the supremacy of Jesus in God's eternal plan is so clearly presented in the book of Ephesians, I, I thought about a statement that is made in the book of Hebrews. And you think about the Jews who believed that they and they alone owned God, they owned the promises of God, they owned the process of God. I read that statement and it made me think about another statement in the book of Hebrews. And the writer there says day after day, day after, he, it's almost like he's writing day after day after endless day. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never, never take away sins. But when this priest, and he's talking about Jesus, when this priest offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. And then he, he closes the thought by saying this, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever 
those who are being saved. And we'll see that theme reflected in our study of Ephesians. The sovereign grace of God in the lives of believers is highlighted all throughout this letter. John Calvin would write that the book of Ephesians was his most favorite book from all of the Bible. So, by way of introduction, here is what we know. We know that Paul visited Ephesus twice. We know that in his second missionary journey, he was there along with Aquila and Priscilla. You can turn back one page in your New Testament and just briefly review Acts chapter 18 and you will find that information. On his third missionary journey, we know that he spent somewhere around three years there and he supported himself by his tent making trade. All of us know that after his departure from Ephesus, that he sent Timothy there to continue his work. We know about Ephesus that it was the chief city in the Roman province of Asia Minor, which today would be identified as Western Turkey. And at the time, it was estimated to have had a population of about a quarter million people when Paul would write this letter. Ephesus was situated near the coast. It had a harbor and a port at a river which flowed into the Aegean Sea. And, and Ephesus, historically at the time, became the greatest commercial city of the Roman province of Asia because it had three major trade routes that all intersected at its location. We know that there were all kinds of people there. The Romans who lived there worshipped the goddess Diana. They built a shrine there to her, a temple to her, which turned out to be the largest Greek temple in the world at that time. We know there were many nationalities represented in Ephesus, many and varying religious beliefs. Many false teachers were there. And thus there was much opportunity to share the message of Christ, to preach the gospel of Jesus and the transforming power that it would bring to the lives of those who believed in him. So we move now to the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, and I hope you found that by now in your Bible. And we're going to try and establish a textual background and a setting for what we're going to be studying in this book of Ephesians. Acts chapter 19. Let's go to the text now and read the first two verses. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So the last time that Paul was in Ephesus was when he was coming back from Corinth on his second missionary journey. Now he comes from the east, arriving in Ephesus from the region of Phrygia. Apollos was not in Ephesus at the time. He had gone, you remember, to Corinth to preach. But Paul, when he arrives, he does find some believers there. He finds some people that the text calls disciples. But there seemed to be something about them that prompted him to ask the question, when you came to believe in Jesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit? As I said earlier, I'd be much more comfortable if Dr. Lloyd was explaining all of this text. So, Dr. Lloyd, if there's something I miss here and you want to jump in and add, feel free to do so. There's something about these people that causes Paul to ask the question, when you believe, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Now, I looked in the text and I looked in commentary and, and, and my conclusion is I can't be sure why Paul asked this question. But whatever his reasons were, there was something that prompted it. There was something that asked him, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I heard a preacher one time tell a story about baptizing a young lady. And he got her down into the baptistry and he told her, now when you are baptized, you are going to receive the remission of your sins. You will be added to the body of Christ. You will receive the Holy Spirit. And he said the words that he was going to say and he led her down into the baptistry and he said there was just a, a thud. There was an audible thud. And he said when he brought her up out of the water, 
she took her hand and she was kind of rubbing the back of her head and he thought, wow, did she just receive the Holy Spirit? If she did, I didn't get that when I was baptized. Never seen that happen with anyone when they were baptized. And he said the truth of the matter was he stood too close to the bottom step and when he baptized her, he banged her head off the bottom step. But it prompted him to ask, what, what happened? What's going on? I don't know what prompted Paul to ask did you receive the Holy Spirit? Something prompted him to ask that question. And their reply, by their reply, we know that on the one hand, they are called, they are referred to as disciples, as believers. But the text is pretty clear that we know on the other hand, their knowledge of what God would provide to them at this point was still incomplete. It may be that these people Paul came into contact with in this setting were not from the core group of believers that Paul left behind with Aquila and Priscilla designated to serve them. Actually, Aquila and Priscilla were with Paul for a year and a half in Corinth. So if you go over there and you read the letters to the Corinthians, there you read about Paul teaching them about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So I think we get a little more information and a little more insight into what's going on here when we go back to the text now and we add verses 3 and 4. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked them. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. Now the circumstance becomes a little bit clearer. These Ephesian disciples that are being described here had a basic understanding of the Messiah, that a Messiah would come, that Jesus would come, and what his ministry would be about. Whatever they knew, they gained that knowledge and that understanding through the teaching and the preaching of John the Baptist. I, I think it's safe to say that basically they were in the same place as Apollos, before Aquila and Priscilla explained to him the way of God more accurately. And you read about that in chapter 18 of Acts. Now, I have no way of knowing if they received the baptism of John at the hands of John himself or perhaps at the hands of some of John's disciples who continued on in his ministry after his death. And that's really not the point anyway. Paul points out that John's baptism was one of repentance, was one that pointed to the Messiah, that pointed to Jesus, but did not take them to the man himself. So if I try and use my imagination and put myself into what's going on here, I can imagine that these Ephesians disciples had heard about, been taught about, had learned about the coming of the Messiah through the message of John and about their need to be prepared, their need to be ready through repentance to receive the Messiah when he did come. It would seem to me that they had not actually heard that the Messiah has in fact come. Now, if you go to scholars and commentators on this, and if you read commentary about all of this, which I did, the discussion is all over the place. And there is all this discussion and debate about whether these people were actually Christians just yet. And I can tell you with full assurance that Jim is not smart enough to sort all that out. I do know that the scripture refers to them as disciples, refers to them as believers, that almost always in Scripture refers to Christians, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is the case just here. Whatever the case, let me just give you a little comfort by saying that the issue is about to be solved in verses 5, 6, and 7. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So now we learn about the size of the group being discussed here. But I want to make sure that we give credit where credit is due just here. John the Baptist gets the lion's share of credit because John the Baptist taught these people. He preached to these people. He prepared these people. These 12 men were completely 
prepared to make an appropriate response to the Messiah because of what John the Baptist had taught them. He had them ready. They now learned from Paul, yes, the Messiah has indeed come. His name is Jesus. And the text there tells us, Luke tells us, they were immediately baptized into his name. And in this particular instance, they received the Holy Spirit miraculously as Paul laid his hands on them and they received it with some miraculous manifestations of being able to speak in tongues in other languages and to prophesy. I think it's interesting something Charles Spurgeon writes about this. Spurgeon says, give a man an electric shock and I guarantee you he's going to know it. But if he has the Holy Spirit, he should know it much, much more. His conclusion was, if someone doesn't seem to know that the power and the presence and the reality of the Holy Spirit is in their life, Spurgeon would say, it's probably fair to assume that they don't have it. In any case, we move deeper into Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Let's read verses 8 through 10. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly Notice the time frame here. For the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some, and we know who those some would be, some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So, Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. It's very interesting to me that Paul is allowed an extended time, three months, of preaching in the synagogue. And we know what he preached. We know what his message was. But there were some people there who did not like that, who would not accept that. And eventually the influence of those Jews who did not like what he was saying drove him out. But you know, Paul, Paul didn't give up. He didn't stop. He didn't quit. He didn't throw his hands up. Just because he could not continue teaching in the synagogue, he just finds another place. He resumes his teaching in the hall of a Gentile teacher named Tyrannus. There is an ancient writing that I looked at this week. It is not inspired. But an ancient writing that says that Paul held his meetings in the school of Tyrannus from 11 every morning until 4 every afternoon and that he did it every single day. Now think about that. Think about that. As your study guide points out here, if you just want to refer over to it, Paul now has access to the ears Lots and lots of people who would never have found themselves in a synagogue. They would not have entered a synagogue. And this gained him a favorable hearing from a lot of people who needed to hear the gospel. From a lot of people who were not Jewish. So if you do the math in your mind, if Paul is teaching for hours every single day, considering his extended time in Ephesus, the sum total means that there were hundreds and thousands of hours spent by Paul teaching about Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, sharing the gospel. And that helps me to understand that it is no wonder that the work that was done in Ephesus was so broad and was so effective. It actually goes on for two years teaching and equipping believers to do the work of ministry. Okay, let's go back to the text and read verses 11 and 12. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. And I'm going to pause just for a moment there. The scripture chooses the word unusual. And, and I would say for all of us, any miracle would seem unusual. But apparently in the mind of God and in the mind of inspiration, there are miracles and there are unusual miracles. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. So here it is. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin, touched Paul's skin, were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Luke calls 
the miracles that God empowered Paul to do unusual. And he gives an example. Handkerchiefs. Some translations literally say sweat bands or sweat rags. When, when handkerchiefs or aprons that had simply touched, come into contact with the skin of Paul, were placed on sick people or people who were possessed with demons, they were healed. I'd say that fits the category of an unusual miracle, wouldn't you? They could be placed on people with evil spirits. Those spirits were exercised. Now, it is even believed by many of the commentators that I read that Paul didn't even have to be present for this to happen. In fact, that it was physically impossible for Paul to be present everywhere and all the time, so long as those fabrics were the ones that had touched his skin. Now, I'm not smart enough to tell you exactly how all of this worked. Other than, in my mind, I think it worked. Dr. Lloyd, tell me if you agree or disagree here. I think it probably worked in the same way as the shadow of Peter worked in Acts chapter 5, or as the, the hem of Jesus' garment worked in Matthew 14. That's pretty much the examples that I could think of. God worked unusual miracles. It's a phrase that could also be translated literally, miracles that were not of the ordinary kind. Here's what I want us to, to take away from this. That the focus and the emphasis is up on God. It's on God. It's not on the handkerchief or the sweat rag or the apron or the Apostle Paul. The emphasis, of course, is upon God. Paul didn't cause these miracles. Paul did not create or do these miracles. God did this. The power of God is what needed to be seen. The power of God is what needed to be focused upon. And as these miracles were happening and as they were putting focus upon God. Guess what happened? The opportunists appear as they always seem to do. Let's go back to the text now and read 13 through 16. A group of Jews, a group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. And I'm just going to tell you, I was sitting there reading this and studying and preparing this week, and I am laughing out loud while I am reading this particular portion of the text. I'm just laughing to myself. Now, at this time, there were Jewish exorcists who practiced their trade, and they did it with a lot of superstition and a lot of ceremony. There was some money involved in all of this. So here is this group of itinerant Jewish exorcists and they're trying to cash in on Paul's ability, on what God has gifted Paul to do. They're trying to cash in and to imitate what they thought was Paul's formula for success. And right here, I'm going to question their motives immediately. I mean, if you are Jewish, not a believer, not a Christian, if you reject Jesus as Messiah, why in the world would you take his name? Why would you invoke his name for anything you're doing unless there's some measure trying to do so for your own personal gain? I command you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out. And they failed because they have no relationship to Jesus. I think we could certainly say that these seven men did not have any right to use the name of Jesus because they have no personal connection to him. You can hear it in their own words. We command you in the name of Jesus, this guy, whoever he is, the one that Paul preaches... And you could no doubt, I think, make that same connection even today to those who use the name of Christ for their own personal profit and gain, but it's pretty apparent that their hearts are not at the same place where the heart of Paul was in his ministry. Now, I don't think there's any judging going on here. I don't think there's any attempt to try and look into someone's heart and to discern if they are truly sincere or not because 
the evil spirits, the demons clear the whole thing up. I mean, they clear it up completely. I love it when a demon or a host of demons speak and they say, no, wait a minute here. I know Jesus. I know who he is. And you can bet I know God. But who are you? Who are you? It's funny, don't you think? The evil spirit knew exactly who Jesus was. And evil spirits knew exactly who Paul was. But there was no knowledge of who these seven men might be. I will tell you, if you go throughout Scripture and you just do a, a quick study of evil spirits and demons, evil spirits in the Bible are very, very clear about who their enemies are. They know all about God. They know the Son of God. They know the people of God. In this case, they knew about God, they knew about Jesus, they knew about Paul. But they don't waste their time and effort knowing those who are really no threat to them, which in this case would be those seven men. So I, I keep on laughing as I picture this scene in my mind. The, the man with the evil spirit or spirits, use your imagination for a minute. The man jumps on them attacks them, overpowers them with such violence that the conclusion is that the seven of them are running for their lives from the scene. They are beaten, they are battered, and they are naked. You got the picture in your imagination now? We command you in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul to come out. And I see the demons with their arms folded saying, Oh, really? Really? We know Jesus and we know God, but, but you seven, we've never heard of you. So tell you what, let's see what you got. Let's see what you've got. And look at the description Luke gives. One man with demons against seven opponents. And he jumps on them, attacks them, overpowers them. It is with great violence. How much violence, you ask? They are running for their lives, battered and naked, beaten up with their clothes ripped off. And I'm laughing at the description, and I suspect that the demons are laughing too. Pretty clear demonstration, don't you think, of where the real power was? Back to the text now. Let's do 17 through 20. The story of what happened spread quickly all throughout Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely, far and near, and it had a powerful, powerful effect. I think it's very interesting the description that Luke gives us about what happened and about how it made such a big, big, big impression. Just look at all of the description of the results that happened from this story. There was fear of the Lord that overtook a whole bunch of people who needed to have a little fear of the Lord. The name of Jesus was magnified. Don't you know it was? Can you imagine if they had had the networks back in that day? The lead story on CNN and Fox and MSNBC and every other network. Can you imagine how they would have sensationalized all of this story? Ephesus was a stronghold for the devil. It, it was a playground for Satan. And in Ephesus, there were many evil things that went on, both superstitious and, and satanic in nature. There was a lot of evil that was practiced. Books that contained formulas for all of these practices were contained and were plentiful there. This incident that we just read, we are told, prompted many folks to renounce all of this connection that they had to their magic and occultic and satanic practices. We might say the events that occurred and the subsequent story that was spread put the fear of God in a lot of these people. 
And people became believers. They confessed that some of these things they had been doing and, and these things they had been practicing, that those things were wrong. And there was a big public bonfire and a burning of the books. The end result, Luke says, was that the word of the Lord grew mightily. The word of the Lord prevailed. And I think these events thus provide the historical and the textual backdrop, as it were, for the letter that we will spend the next 12 weeks reading and discussing. Now, as we go through this, and, and I would encourage you, if you want to just flip over now to the book of Ephesians, that's perfectly fine to do. You know, in most Bibles, there is a chapter heading or there is an individual paragraph heading that gives you just a little summation of what you're about to see. And you feel free to do that as we go through the remainder of this. I think we have the ability in here to walk and chew gum at the same time. But as we go through this, I just want to let you know that Paul is going to provide significant teaching in the book of Ephesians about salvation. You want to know about salvation, read the book of Ephesians. Paul's going to provide significant teaching about reconciliation, about how God has reconciled himself to us through his son Christ. Paul's going to provide a lot of teaching about the nature of God's family, about church. You know, folks, we live in a day and time, I'm sorry to say, when there are a lot of people who think that the church is no longer important. Well, I have a relationship with God and I believe in Jesus. And, you know, the church doesn't really matter. And my, my presence in the church, my participation in the church, my being an active part of functioning part of the body of Christ, it's really, it's really just me and God. And, and the church is really not so significant, so important. I believe if you read the book of Ephesians with an open mind, you'll come away with a different conclusion than that. Paul will spend some time talking about the nature of God's family and about Christian identity. As we go through this, there is doctrine that we shall be taught. There is day-to-day -day life instruction that we will learn. And again, there is so much that we will learn about the basic fundamental nature and importance of the church. We will focus in the book of Ephesians on the mystery of the gospel and how the mystery of that gospel is indeed the true source of genuine wisdom. A man, a woman is not truly wise who is not wise in the truth of the gospel. And in this world that seeks to minimize the importance of the church, you are going to find Paul's words taking exception to that kind of thinking. He will speak of God's eternal purpose. The, the church has been a part of God's eternal plan from the very beginning. You can't minimize the church. Let me ask you a question. How important was the church to Jesus? The answer is pretty evident, isn't it? Important enough that he would die for her. Paul will deal with the very core of what it means to be a Christian. He'll talk about it both in faith, on the doctrinal side, and in practice, on actually living it out in your life, regardless of what might be going on in the world around us. Paul will speak of a wide range of moral and ethical behaviors. And he'll identify that and tie that to your daily Christian walk, to your own personal spiritual maturity. Paul will take opportunity in the book of Ephesians to speak of our many spiritual blessings in Jesus. And Paul will address that age-old idea of being saved by grace through faith. He will speak to the mystery of the gospel and of unity and life and light in Jesus. And he will also address some very important subjects, some, some cultural issues that we struggle with every day in our own lives. He's going to address the topics of husbands and wives and children and slaves. It is also in the book of Ephesians that Paul will describe very vividly for us 
and speak of the whole armor of God. So very, very important. And Paul will lay to rest once and for all any separation between Jew and Gentile. He will put that to rest. He makes very clearly the case that we are all now united in the one body of His Son, Jesus. I believe this will be a marvelous study, and I, I look forward to us being together and doing this together. Dr. Lloyd, anything you want to add to all of this today? Okay. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up before we run out of time. So I'm going to be missing next Sunday, and then I'll be back two weeks from today, and then I'll be missing the next Sunday. So in, just in case you have the wrong conclusion that I don't want to be here when Denny is teaching, that is completely untrue. Every now and then I have the opportunity to speak somewhere else. And whenever someone calls, I say to them, i got to check my Sunday school schedule. Because if it is a Sunday that I am scheduled to teach, I'm not going to ask Dr. Lloyd to double up and fill in for me. So next Sunday, I'm going to be with Centerville Church. And next Sunday, most of you probably know, is a very historic day in the life of our country. It's September the 11th. And Centerville Church is taking the opportunity next Sunday. They, they are having all of the police and the fire department and the paramedics and EMTs and first responders of any kind will be with them on that day. And they're going to use September 11th as a day, as an opportunity to say, we acknowledge you. We thank you for your service. We appreciate who you are. We appreciate what you represent. We appreciate what you do. And I'm going to have the opportunity to be with them. And, and I am going to, of course, echo those words. And the scriptural reference or tie-in that just continues to come to the forefront of my mind is that the Son of God, the one whose very words spoke the universe into existence, on the night he was betrayed, on the night before he died, took a towel and a basin of water and washed the feet of those for whom he would die. If there's a, if there's a better example of what true service really is, I don't, I don't know what it is. So I'll be there next Sunday, be back with you two weeks from today. And then the following Sunday, I'm going to be with the Franklin Church for their homecoming. So has not, there, it's nothing personal, okay? I just want to make sure we got that out there very clearly. Is there anybody who's come in late that needs a book that we could give you a book before we conclude? Okay, thank you so much for being in class this morning.